Alrighty. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Yoka Gawa's analytical web seminar, Extractive Process Oxygen Analysis. We would like to thank you all for taking the time to attend, and we hope you find this seminar helpful and informative. Before we begin, we would like to go over some housekeeping issues. The audio part of this seminar can be accessed either through the teleconference number provided in the info tab of your WebEx manager window or through your PC speakers. To hear the audio through your PC, select the Communicate tab and join the audio broadcast. The seminar will last approximately one hour. Towards the end of the presentation, where time permitting, we will have a question and answer section where our featured speaker today will answer some of the questions received from the audience. If your question is not answered during the presentation, please be assured that we will answer them directly either via email or phone call. All questions should be answered or should be submitted, I'm sorry, in either the question and answer window or the chat window located in your lower right hand corner of your screen. Today our featured speaker is Jesse Underwood. Jesse has served five years as the United Associate Apprenticeship where he learned industrial drafting, instrumentation, and process control prior to becoming a technician for DuPont. He later became an area sales rep for analytical specialties, which was acquired by Yoka Gawa in 2008. Today, he provides sales and technical support for analyzer function as well as application specialist for the new Yoka Gawa Laser Analysis Division. Without further ado, we'd like to get the seminar started by handing it over to our speaker, Jesse Underwood. Thank you very much, Sherilyn, for the wonderful introduction. And I'd like to also join in her in thanking everybody for attending today's uh, webinar. <clears throat> I looked at the attendee list before starting this meeting and noticed that we had several people joining us from India, Australia, Denmark, Costa Rica. Just to name a few, I'd like to extend my thanks for your, your willingness to stay up late uh, to try to learn something new about these unique challenges that we all face. And process oxygen analysis certainly does present everyone with specific challenges because of this unique gas in oxygen uh, that is like most other light gases being that the lighter they are, the harder they are to measure. So I hope today that I will be able to impart all of the understanding that I have gained so that we can all do our jobs better and run our processes more efficiently. So oxygen analysis is very relevant in the process world, whether it's refining, chemical, uh, pretty much any process that is burning anything is very conscious of these oxygen values and can have a high impact on the safety of the process and also on the quality of the products that they produce. Uh, oxygen itself is one of the most commonly uh, common single component gases that we analyze, uh, moisture being the other. And then most other gases, we're looking at multiple components. But in many streams, oxygen itself is the most, the most important for many reasons. So what I have listed on the screen here are just a few of the processes that we have used our oxygen technology in. Uh, this is just a small representation of the whole. As our particular business here at Yokogawa, oxygen has made up about 60 to 70 percent of our overall business. So being one of the market leaders in the tunable diode laser world, we have been introduced to several unique challenges. Uh, we did a project last year where a customer was taking tires from cars, trucks, uh, tractor trailers, and turning them into fuel, and it presented a whole array of challenges that were completely new to us. So this oxygen analysis is not just for control, uh, but also for safety, uh, being that oxygen is one of the, the critical parts of the fire triangle. Many people are trying to identify what that oxygen value is to understand that their process is in a safe state. So again, I have listed just a few of 
a few of the processes that use oxygen analysis to maintain safety. In 1891, Scottish chemist Sir James Jewer discovered that oxygen was magnetic when he managed to attract liquid oxygen to the poles of a magnet. It was not understood why this phenomenon happened until quantum theory was later developed. Then molecular oxygen has two unpaired electrons. This state of oxygen is not reactive and is how it is found in nature. When there is no unpaired electrons, this compound is highly reactive and unstable, and this is very important for us to understand when I later relate the infrared spectroscopy and how it, uh, how it uh, pertains to this interaction. So understanding the unique magnetic properties of oxygen, these first paramagnetic analyzers uh, were first introduced into the market about 50 years ago. The most commonly used today uses a magnetodynamic or dumbbell sensor. And this concept starts with focusing a magnetic field, and any oxygen will be attracted into the strongest part of the field, just like the Scottish chemist found. So two nitrogen-filled glass spheres are mounted on a rotating suspension within the magnetic field, and a mirror is mounted centrally on the suspension, and a light is shown onto the mirror, and the reflected light is directed onto a pair of photocells, which enables the current to be generated to compensate for the twisting, to flow through a wire arranged around the dumbbell. And the compensating current is proportional not to the oxygen, but to the displacement caused by any paramagnetic gas or any gas that is diamagnetic, which there are about 130 uh, that we know of. So this, this type of sensor is very repre uh, has, a, has a lot of representation of what most analytical sensors have, and that is the sensor itself has to be exposed to the process gas, whatever process gas that might be. So when that process gas goes over the sensor, we're looking for a reaction from that sensor. So in this case, we're looking for the oxygen to displace these glass-filled spheres. So this type of technique, being that the, the process must contact the sensor, uh, it requires an extremely clean and dry sample, and because it is subject to wind or flow changes, it requires that the sample being shown to the sensor be held at a very tight flow rate, and this flow rate must not fluctuate. So, again, being that the sensor is exposed to it, we have to be very conscious of any corrosives that could possibly be in the stream, and also we have to treat the sample with extreme care as to take away all of the particulates and moisture. So there are several considerations when using this technique, which has been the standard in the industry, to make sure that we get the maximum life out of the sensor, that we do not introduce error to the sensor, and we do not corrode the sensor. So it's a very delicate thing, but if we are able to control all of these things and understand up front what the challenges in the process are, uh, then this, this technique can be used reliably to provide an oxygen analysis. So on the, on the flip side of this, we have vibrational spectroscopy, which is a technique uh, that, is, that, could, that also can be used for oxygen. So infrared vibrational or transitional spectroscopy is a technique which can be used to identify molecules by analysis of the bond that binds the constituent atoms. Each bond in a molecule vibrates at a frequency which is a characteristic
characteristic of that particular bond. A group of atoms in a molecule like CO2 may have multiple modes of oscillation caused by the stretching and bending motions. If one or more of these stretching and bending motions leads to a change in dipole in the molecule, then it will absorb a photon, which has the same frequency. The photon is effectively infrared light of a specific frequency, which means that the degree of attenuation or loss of light at that particular frequency is proportional to the quantity of gas present in the sample. So <clears throat> oxygen is completely unique in the sense that it does not perform any of these um, any of these types of vibration, what you see here with symmetrical stretching and rocking and wagging. Uh, oxygen is unique in the fact that it's a homonuclear diatomic molecule. And what does that mean? It means that it is completely balanced because the two constituent atoms are the same. And then it has a double bond. And this means that the gas is not going to, the gas molecule is not going to vibrate or resonate at a particular frequency. But there is, uh, there is absorption of infrared light with the oxygen molecule. And how that takes place is with an electron transition. So earlier I mentioned that when there is no unpaired electrons, the compound is highly reactive. What we have found and what other tunable diode laser manufacturers have found is that we can generate a specific frequency of light to cause the molecule, the oxygen molecule, to go from two unpaired electrons to two unpaired electrons. And this transition absorbs a very small amount of infrared light, but that does allow us to quantify that, that uh, amount of attenuation and have a percent level measurement of oxygen. So in the infrared, you see the full range here listed on the screen. Uh, the, in, the, infra, the near infrared where tunable diode laser manufacturers uh, can, can find these lasers to produce these frequencies of light, it's only from about 700 nanometers up to about 2,400 nanometers. And with most gases, like moisture and CO2, we have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of peaks to choose from. With oxygen, there's only, uh, there's less than a dozen peaks to choose from. And it just so happens that these dozen or so peaks are in an area of the infrared where no other gas absorbs light. So with a paramagnetic sensor, on record, we, we know of over 130 interferences, but with this infrared spectroscopy technique, there are no known inter interferences uh, understood to, by anybody, so completely interference-free. So with, with this infrared spectroscopy, this, this legacy type, this non-dispersive infrared, uh, was the first where we have a light source that produces a very broad band of the infrared. And that light would be passed through a sample gas. And then an optical filter would be placed in between, and that filter would take out a smaller part of the infrared specific to the gas that was of interest. And that light would be shown to the detector. So this is a, a typical spectra shot of what this legacy infrared analyzer would be seeing. So we have to establish two things with this optical technique. We have to have a comparable from how much light made it through the process that wasn't attenuated by the target gas. And then we have to know how much light was attenuated by the target gas. We have to have a comparable there, a zero uh, zero has to be understood. So 
we can't just put one filter in front of the light bulb because we wouldn't have an understanding of what to compare the attenuation to. So what you see here is a, a three filter spectra or three target gas spectra. So on filter one, that would be the gas of interest. And in this representation, this is moisture with the with peak number two, and then peak number one, the blue peak, you would have CO2. So with this three-filter technique, you would have the reference filter, which would be number two for zero, and then filter one and filter three would be for the target gases that we are trying to measure. So you can have multiple filters to look at multiple gases. So these types of instruments could be used for multi-component analysis. Each one of these filters would be taking about 10 to 20 nanometers out of the infrared. But with many of these infrared absorbing gases, the specific peak of interest is much smaller than this 10 nanometer band. So what these particular filters are doing are looking at the bulk absorption or total absorption in that range and then accumulating it and coming up with this absorption peak that looks like one peak but is actually made up of many. So these light gases that absorb infrared that TDLs can measure usually have what's called or referred to as fine rotational structure, where if we had a high resolution device, we would look at one of these broad peaks that would be of 10 nanometers wide, but that high-resolution device would be able to identify multiple peaks within the peak. And these individual peaks are very, can be very narrow, uh, sometimes less than 0.1 nanometer wide. So if we were to take that spectra from the two previous slides and have this high resolution device to zoom in on the, the peak of interest, we would find that there are many peaks within that, that broad spectra. So with the tunable diode lasers, the, the shift from a broadband technique to a narrow technique, we can zoom in on that single peak of interest and make a scan over that peak alone, completely nullifying all of the other peaks around it. So with gases like CO, CO2, H2O, CH4, NH3, uh, very common gases that we measure, oxygen doesn't have to worry about any of the other background gases. It would be just the specific uh, peak of interest we would find for oxygen. So whether it's oxygen or CO or H2O, this laser, the actual laser beam that would be emitting out of the device, the beam itself is so narrow that we cannot even see a peak. So the, the, we have listed here on the screen the, the wavelength emission, the width, being at 0 .00004 nanometers wide. And that's very important to understand because we call these devices tunable diode lasers. So it's, un it's understood that we use diode lasers, but we call it tunable because we're able to change the wavelength of the, of the diode so that we can go from one wavelength and tune it over the peak of interest to another wavelength. Well, what you see here on the screen is very important on the top right-hand side because like the legacy NDIR infrared photometers, we too have to have a comparable. We have to understand how much light was attenuated and also how much light made it across. So in one of these scans, we have multiple regions. We have a region where no infrared light is absorbed, and then we have another region where the peak of interest is being measured, and then we have another area uh, which we call baseline. So during this scan, we cannot just scan over the peak of interest. We have to scan an area off of the peak and hopefully on both sides of the peak. And this 
baseline is the zero. That is the zero of the analyzer. And I can't go into all of it, uh, but this is the self-referencing characteristic of tunable diode lasers that enables us to have a very long time in between calibrations, the self-referencing characteristic. So if there were just one particular scan, if we just scanned if we just scanned this peak one time, what it would look like is something like this. You would just have a tremendous amount of noise and, and maybe a little bump in here where the peak would be. And these lasers, I think one characteristic of them is they're extremely noisy. So measures have to be taken to reduce the noise, and these techniques have, be, have been done in different ways. The particular technique that we use uh, is using the law of averages where we take 1,000 scans of this peak per second, and then we'll average that over 2 to 20 seconds, depending on what the update, update time would, would be required by the customer. But, but these tunable diode lasers, we're not always able to take these thousands of scans per second. And within each scan, we're picking up hundreds of data points because the, the laser is so narrow. So <clears throat> this, these tunable diode lasers, uh, the way we started in our particular business was what you see here on the bottom left, this TDLS 200. We had a large push from customers to completely do away with extractive oxygen analyzers, with extractive uh, sample handling systems and probes and all of these things which were, wherewith errors are generated, not only from lag time, but removing the moisture out of the uh, stream, which creates a volumetric error in the oxygen reading. Uh, but there's many, many things that customers wanted to get away from. So the first product that we produced was this in situ type device. So there was a great benefit understood by customers and us to remove the sample handling systems and remove the necessity of analyzer shelters. But this was not always possible for customers to put an in-situ device on their process. So after producing this and being very successful with it, uh, we came up with an extractive tunable diode laser system, which is used what you see here with the TDLS 220. Uh, and we built this so that it could be basically a rip and replace of paramagnetic analyzers. So this goes over these, this top, these top comments here. I'll go over what I just, what I just expressed and that uh, these customers wanted to go with a device that did not have the volumetric errors that did not have the errors due to volumetric change and wanted to reduce the amount of lag time. And these paramagnetic sensors were very flow sensitive, very particulate sensitive, very moisture sensitive. And they wanted a, a means of removing the sensor from the process. So with tunable diode lasers, we're just injecting light into the process, which is what you see here uh, with the TDLS 200. And that proves the same with the TDLS 220. So being that we're only putting light into the process, we can put a window barrier in between the process and the, the laser, which is the source, the sensor. So removing the sensor from the process and greatly increases the mean time to failure. And it's not just paramagnetic analysis, uh, paramagnetic, paramagnetic sensors. Uh, almost all analytical systems must expose the sensor to the process, whether it's catalytic feed technology, whether it's zirconium oxide technology, uh, even gas chromatographs have to pass the gas over the detector, over the sensor. Uh, so this proved to be a great advantage and is one reason why we had such a large push uh, from our customers to build this extractive tunable diode laser system. So I'm not going to go not going to go over all of the true peak features here on the top. I'm just going to going to mention 
a few. Uh, one of the great advantages of this tunable diode laser technique is that because it is an optical measurement and we're continuously measuring the light that is making it through the process and onto the detector, uh, it provides a characteristic of analyzers that few have, and that's called a positive indication of operation. And why that is important is because these oxygen analyzers, a large number of them are on safety systems. So with most analytical uh, techniques, if the analyzer fails, if the sensor dies, uh, there is no indication of such. So it would just be uh, whatever the last value was on the 4 to 20, or if, if, it, was, if it automatically goes to zero, what, whatever that may be. But there is no, uh, a lot of times there is no trigger. There is no advanced warning. There, there is uh, nothing for the process operations group to, to, uh, to get a signal from the analyzer to know that it's down. Well, with this optical technique, being that the light is on the detector hopefully all the time, if there is a problem with the analyzer, our particular analyzer is recording about 18 variables continuously, and each one of these variables has thresholds. And if any of those values go outside of the thresholds, the analyzer has built-in uh, warnings and faults, which are two completely separate categories. So uh, we, we, ha we have had a full fill assessment on both of these instruments uh, and, and with the 3 million plus run hours, we turned over to uh, to Exida and to the other TUV certified safety experts. Uh, both of them found that with the probability of failure on demand average that these have, uh, which considers what type of failures they are, they, what type of failures were, uh, were realized, both of these have been found to be used uh, to be applicable to SIL-1 and SIL-2 applications, uh, which has been very advantageous for customers to get those credits. So I could stay on this topic for a very long extended period of time, but I just want, to, want you to understand the differences between paramagnetic analysis and tunable diode lasers. So, so another quick characteristic of this type of measurement is with, with just light being put through a process, uh, there is no flow sensitivity whatsoever. This is not in milliliters per minute. Our customers are typically putting 1 to 10 liters per minute through this TDLS220, and if there is a flow variation, that has no bearing on the instrument. So you, you see here the, the migration or, or the options as far as installation goes with these tunable diode laser products. Uh, I told you that many customers of ours were pushing us to build a replacement analyzers directly for paramagnetics. Uh, so in cases where there already is a shelter uh, and the analyzer sample system is locally located there, these instruments can be put normally in the same footprint as those paramagnetics. Uh, one great advantage of this TDLS-220 is that it can be placed outdoors in almost all uh, situations. Uh, the ambient temperature rating is 10 below C to 50 C. So instead of having 40 meters of sample transport to get to a place where the analyzer would be in an, an environmentally safe area, uh, these instruments can be placed at the sample takeoff to reduce that time, uh, the time lag, and also to reduce the, the potential for condensing in those sample lines, which is, has been a problem. So this in-situ bypass is a technique that we have used and realized great results with. Uh, whenever a sample, uh, whenever a process Whatever a customer would like to be able to isolate an, an instrument of, of any nature from the process uh, to do zero and span, you, you have to isolate those sensors. So this in-situ bypass enables 
the instrument to be isolated from the process and a true zero and span be performed. Uh, the most common of all of our applications have been this in situ cross pipe, and this has been great for things such as marine vapor recovery, uh, such as uh, measuring the oxygen and headspace of a tank or any vent lines or flare lines where we just put this analyzer directly across the pipe. So again, uh, on the comparison of tunable diode laser to magnetic, uh, the chips stack much a stack in favor of tunable diode laser for many different reasons. Uh, samples that are saturated with moisture were able to keep those, if we're able to keep those uh, compounds in the vapor phase, they do not have to be removed from the sample. So there's no volumetric error uh, induced into the reading. And if this, that, that is very important if that if those compounds that would condense, if those are, are varying in concentration. So if, if you have a moisture content that could be uh, 2 to 15, 20 percent, if that value was removed constantly, then your oxygen value is going to be changing uh, and introducing more or less error depending on what factor you've put in for that moisture. So I, I told you earlier that these these tunable diode lasers are actually measuring the oxygen 1,000 times a second. And that the response time or, or uh, update time can be configured anywhere from 2 to 20 seconds. Uh, normal depth is 5 seconds. Another key characteristic of this is that there is no cross interference uh, and, and customers Customers often come to us and say, is this specific gas or is this specific gas an interference? Well, that, that, that does have to be considered when measuring other components such as uh, moisture or CO or HF or HCL or any of these other infrared absorbing gases. But for oxygen, uh, that is not a concern for us. So the only concern would be keeping everything in a vapor phase. But if it happens to be that the sample does condense, and if this has happened to us, it happened very recently to us in Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, a customer had a sample take off that was quite a ways from the, the analyzer, and they asked us if they should heat trace the sample line coming from the sample take off to the analyzer. Well, we told them if they were confident that just insulation would be enough, then go with that. But if they were concerned to go with a heat, a heat trace line from point A to point B. Now, we still heat trace the entire sample system at the analyzer uh, and the flow cell, which I will get into. And we were keeping all of this. We can keep it up to 120 Celsius, but we were keeping it at about 110 uh, well, in Corpus Christi a couple weeks ago, the temperature got down to right at freezing or a little a little less, and that led to the condensing of the stream and the pipe and completely filled up the flow cell with liquid. Well, if this would have been a paramagnetic analyzer, uh, they no doubt would have had to replace the sensor, which can be costly and time-consuming. Uh, well, with our instrument, because the sensor was removed from the process, all they had to do was drain it and clean the windows, so there was no sensor damage. Uh, of the paramagnetic interferences, uh, most of the gases that do interfere are not paramagnetic, where they do not have a magnetic draw. Uh, most of them are diamagnetic, and that's that's represent, uh, represented here on this this chart. Uh, and these values, these Interference values are taken directly from the manuals of the instruments. Uh, so we're not trying to throw any stones here at these guys. These are published values for the, the potential interferences. So as you see here, hydrocarbons can have a tremendous diamagnetic effect. So what that is doing is giving you an error that is represented as a lower oxygen value. 
which is in the unsafe direction. So normally, this would be a safety measurement when oxygen is in the presence of hydrocarbons. So if you want, uh, not if you want air, but if any error would be there, you would prefer that the error be in the safe direction. So you have too much oxygen in the presence of hydrocarbons, you could have an explosion. So it is a, it is a major concern for a lot of users uh, to, to understand what those potential errors could be and then to add up those potential errors and then reduce the, the, the value of the alarm point or, or the action point. So with, uh, with tunable diode lasers, this has no effect whatsoever. So one of, another characteristic of the, the, these tunable diode lasers is that we're able to uh, take a tremendous amount of diagnostics. So if a, if a paramagnetic or a electrochemical cell, for that matter, if it were to have a problem uh, or if it were to fail, there would be no way to to go back in history of the analyzer and look at what triggered the failure or what caused the failure. All you could do is go up to it and put on some zero and span gas to try to recreate the event. Well, being that this is an optical measurement, we can record a tremendous amount of information. Uh, the actual spectra that the analyzer is producing, the peak and also the detector signal, uh, these analyzers store them about every 200 updates. So if the analyzer is measuring every five seconds, every 200 of those updates, uh, it stores that spectra. If there is a warning or a fault, a failure of the analyzer, uh, we can put in a value to automatically record several of those images in a row. So an operator could say we had an event last night at 1.22 in the morning, and then the analyzer stores about 14 days of this history. So you could go back and look at the spectra to know if there was any oxygen there or not. So if there is a peak, you could be absolutely assured that no other gas in this universe would generate that peak. So with the paramagnetic analyzers and other types, you would not be able to reproduce that event. But that's not the only information the analyzer stores. Uh, every single update, the analyzer uh, timestamps and records 18 variables. And this has been a tremendous advantage for us for troubleshooting the analyzers in the field. So uh, each update goes into a daily file. And if you open up that daily file, what that accumulates to are about 18,000 timestamps a day where we're tracking the transmission strength, the oxygen concentration, the standard deviation, and many, many more things. Uh, and then those values can be compared to the spectra to make sure uh, that, that they line up correctly and help to identify any potential problems. So it also does things like store the alarm history, the calibration history. Uh, so we've had, we've had situations where a customer was validating the analyzer or checking the span of the analyzer and it was coming up and failing. Well, you enter in the values that you're putting into this validation process, uh, and they were using a 1% oxygen bottle. Uh, unbeknownst to them, somebody had switched that bottle out with an 11% bottle. Well, we didn't know that from our end, but they gave us the data, and we analyzed it and told them they were using 11%. We were looking at how tall the peak was, what the area of the peak was, and many other things, and told them exactly what the problem was. So when they went out to check the instrument, they checked the bottle and found out that it was just that. It was 11%. So this has also proved very, uh, very helpful where we could have this peak simulation or build a potential peak based off of certain parameters. Uh, I know I'm kind of going slow here, but I think this is very relevant to the situation, very relevant to the conversation. A customer was using an electrochemical cell oxygen analyzer that was taking a, a sam the sample takeoff was at the stack. And this, this particular customer was using this for controlling their furnace. Well, we installed one of our, our two of our tunable diode lasers. Uh, these were the in situ variety. 
Uh, one was measuring oxygen, the other was measuring CO and CH4, and we were shooting the beam right over the flames, and whenever we turned them on and commissioned them, the analyzers were, uh, the oxygen analyzer, our oxygen TDL, was measuring 8.5% excess O2. Well, the electrochemical analyzer that they were using for control was measuring 3.5. Well, obviously, being that we were the new analyzer, they said that yours is incorrect. So we walked through the whole system, the purging, uh, the temperature input that we were using, looked at every potential problem and confirmed that there was no problem with our instrument. So them not being satisfied with that, we put all of those values into our peak simulator. And we, we put in the temperature, the pressure, the length, the laser was exposed to the process, and we came up with 8.4% oxygen. So our analyzer was reading 0.1 uh, from that, from deviated from that. Well, we implored the technicians to take another look at their electrochemical cell analyzer, and they found out that it had selectable ranges, a low, medium, and high range. So they found out that the analyzer had been calibrated to one range and put on the other, selected to the other. So when they changed that range, it read 8.4% oxygen. So with that other type of technology, you would not be able to, to troubleshoot it in the manner that we did and validate that it was or was not working correctly. So this, this is the mechanical makeup of this TDLS-220. Uh, the laser module and the tech module are both located in the housing at the top right. And then a sapphire window is placed in front of them with a CalRes O-ring. And the laser shoots through the window into the flow cell. And on the far left-hand side, that light bounces off of a gold-plated mirror with a chemical coating over it. And then that light bounces back to the detector. So that detector picks up the light and sends the signal into the control box. And this control box is the same makeup as what is in the TDLS 200. So we were able to use uh, all of the same software and most of the same hardware uh, from, one in, from one tunable diode laser product to the other. So this, uh, this flow cell can be wrapped with heat tracing and in the bottom right-hand side in the box, we have a 24-volt power supply where you would bring in the line power. But we can also put a heat trace controller and a temperature controller inside. So that, that uh, temperature of the electric heat trace can be controlled to any range of temperature. Uh, one of the problems with the paramagnetic is that they had to be controlled at one or two selective temperatures, and that was it. Well, with this one, it can be set to any desirable range uh, all the way up to 120 C. So we don't want to assume that the sample is that particular temperature. So whenever we do this, we'll put in this temperature probe to have uh, feedback for the small P and ID control for regulating the temperature going through the process, going through the flow cell. So this particular flow cell with stainless steel that you see here, uh, but we've already had requests and built these out of Manel and Hastelloy, and our machine shop tells us they could build these things out of anything, whatever process or well, what material uh, is called for. Uh, this instrument, by, by the way it's built, uh, is fit for unclassified hazardous areas for general purpose. Uh, we did this because we wanted to be able to open up all of the electronics and make every electrical component field replaceable or field repairable. And the other option was to hermetically seal everything so they could, it would automatically be applicable to classified areas. So we went with the option that made most sense to us so that the analyzer could be worked on in the field, and if it did need to go into a hazardous area, we could use a 
an external Z purge or X purge or even Y purge for that matter to accommodate. So in these cases, a small amount of purge gas would go into the control head and then flow through the tubing into the controller and through another bulkhead fitting into uh, the power box. So this, like most other instruments, has many outputs. Uh, the, the most common outputs are the, the analog outputs, and that's one for concentration uh, and one we dedicate for transmission because we believe it is a very good diagnostic to know the health of the analyzer if the windows are fouling. Uh, we would definitely want you to see the trend of that transmission falling. Uh, and for this particular analyzer, we can do a dual range of oxygen with a third analog output. Uh, what you see here for inputs, if you know the process, the sample is going to be fluctuating in pressure, then we would recommend you bring a pressure compensation in, and that would be via analog input. Uh, and also temperature, which we do that ourselves. If you tell us that that temperature could fluctuate, we will automatically supply uh, this RTD configuration. So we have many digital outputs as well. We have valve control that we can use for doing automatic uh, calibration checks of the analyzer. It has the valve drivers, the logic, and the timer built in to perform this. But we also want to give indication of warning status. And, of course, a warning is anything that affects the analyzer but not the measurement. So this warning would trip when things like uh, the concentration is out of range or the transmission is reaching a threshold of failure. Uh, it encompasses about eight different things that we want to identify to the user that there potentially could be a failure. Of course, fault means that there is a failure. And in this warning and fault, we have all the configurations to do uh, to drive the analog inputs or analog outputs of the instrument to full scale, uh, or we can track the values or hold the values, or even drive it sub milliamp to 3.3 milliamps. Uh, we also have Ethernet capability with the instrument. Uh, we do use a Windows based software. And that software resides on a compact flash card mounted to a single board computer. And we can plug Ethernet directly into the, to the single board computer and carry that uh, software anywhere you want, onto a network or onto a laptop. Uh, and that would be for configuring the instrument, changing values, or even doing the data transfer uh, of the 14 days of history to uh, another station. Another means of pulling the information off of the analyzer is via USB memory stick. Uh, you could, this instrument, we built a read react drive into the compact flash card so that a technician or engineer can walk up to the analyzer and plug in this USB memory stick and the analyzer would read any information to upload, but if there is none, it would react and copy all of the files on the compact flash card onto the memory stick. And we use this for troubleshooting the analyzer so the technician can plug it into his computer and then email us the pertinent information for us to evaluate. And this has been a very good tool for us. Uh, we, well, some of our first analyzers went to Australia and there was a lightning storm. Imagine that in Australia. And it's, uh, caused a failure in one of the analyzers and it not to start. So they emailed us the information. Uh, we saw several uh, power surges, several on-offs of the software, uh, and we were able to send them an upload file, and they put it on their USB memory stick, plug it into the instrument, and it brought a, an update to the software that fixed it. Uh, this compact flashcard that I keep mentioning is another great tool. Uh, if there is a, a loss of power to the instrument, and there was an upset in the process that led to that, uh, if the analyzer's down, you can take this compact flash card off, put it into a reader, and look at the events that led up to the instrument failure, something that's uh, very unique to our instrument. So 
we have some different HMIs for uh, the instruments. Uh, one being we can just put a completely blind unit, if that's a concern, the corrosives would eat at the window that we put on. Uh, we can also do a very small display with just updates to the user with information such as what the oxygen concentration is, what the light transmission, and then we have a system status. So if there is a warning or fault or multiples, that, that would be updated continuously so a user could know what the status of the instrument is. And then we have this six and a half inch LCD display with its stainless steel keypad, and this just allows you to configure the analyzer. So being that we have Ethernet capability, we can take multiple analyzers, put them all on a, a network, or run all individual Ethernet cables to a switch, uh, and that switch could be a remote location uh, and brought up onto a desktop or a laptop just to configure the analyzer to do data retrieval from the analyzer, et cetera. And the IP address is configurable, so if a local network is available in the plant, we can uh, designate the IP address to whatever your uh, IT team thinks it should be, and then that acts, the analyzer interface could be accessed from anywhere on that network. And the, the software that we use is non-proprietary. It's free. It comes with the analyzer. It's just a virtual network controller. So this, uh, these screens here are very important. Uh, if, the, if you just want to look at the data from the analyzer without doing any data transfer, it stores about 750 minutes continuously. So if somebody came in uh, at 6 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning and the, up, the operator said there was a problem at 3 o'clock in the morning, a uh, user could just walk up to it and go through any of these on the top left, any of these gas concentrations, standard deviation, uh, laser temperature, et cetera, to see if there was any evident problem with the instrument. And then he could go to the menu uh, that you see on the bottom right and look at the actual raw detect signal and absorption spectrum. So there's several key features on here. I'm not going to, to go over all of them, uh, but something that has been very beneficial for us is this capture button. So we recently uh, had some phenomena that we had never seen before with a customer in Fort McMurray, Alberta, which is uh, far from anywhere. I was there last week, and it was 30 below C, or 30 below Fahrenheit uh, with tremendous winds. Uh, but he was having problems with the instrument, and he had ran some tests. Uh, with changes in different purge flow rates, purge temperatures, and was getting some, some unexpected results. Uh, so, and so he just sent me an email with the list of tests and the results. So what I asked him to do was go uh, perform the test again, and every time he got to a different step in the process, capture the spectra. So this would be the ultimate comparable from what he's performing as far as the test goes and when he hits that capture button, he's pulling all of the information off for us to evaluate. Very, very important. So as far as price goes, we're very competitive with the paramagnetic analyzers. Now, not all of them. There are some uh, GE and some others that are, are extremely inexpensive, but very uh, very rarely do you see them in demanding process applications or safety instrumented systems. Uh, so this is the generic pricing. Uh, being that we control our own machine shop, our, our factory is here in Houston, Texas, and we have a machine shop at our disposal, uh, we can pretty much build these things out of whatever material we want or make any changes. Uh, we do not have to ask permission to make a change to our own analyzer. And that's been very advantageous for us. So some of the pertinent information that we would need to know to consider an application, uh, first, is there an existing sample system? Or do we need to build one specifically for our product? Uh, temperature, pressure, all of those things are very important. What are you going to do with the sample after it leaves the analyzer is very important. We need to know that. 
Uh, and we like to know what the alarm levels, action levels, uh, so we can give you the best idea of, of how to operate the instrument so that we uh, provide a big enough buffer for you in accuracy to stay away from that action level or alarm level. So this is a couple that we built uh, for a, a customer of ours where we, the customer wanted to put the analyzers directly next to the sample takeoff. This was a safety critical application. They wanted a redundant system so they could meet their SILT 2 requirements. Uh, so we built a system out of weatherized materials, weatherized parts, uh, so we could put this directly next to the sample takeoff. So the analyzers were mounted on one side, uh, and the sample system was mounted on the other. This particular customer did not have a lot of room in any analyzer shelters. So that room is of incredible value. And any time we can take an instrument out of the analyzer shelter, that's going to make room for another instrument that will need the weatherization. So in conclusion, the tunable diode laser products being introduced in the, into the oxygen market has dramatically shaped, uh, changed uh, the way it is approached and the way that uh, the, the expectations of the, of the analyzers. And that's due to the, the elimination of any cross interference, a very fast measurement, and a sensor that is not contaminated by the process. So I'm going to open the floor. I've taken my full hour. If anybody has any questions, I will be happy to address everyone. So you can type those in. I'm not sure how to make any, let anybody speak over the phone, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jesse, for a wonderful presentation. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in either the chat or the Q&A section in the windows on the right-hand side. Also, if you have um, any other information that you need after this event, feel free. There's Jesse's contact information or you can, what would be a better email to use is the advanced analytical at us.yokogawa.com. That goes to all of the um, individuals that would be able to answer your questions so someone can get a hold of you or get an answer to you quicker if Jesse is at, uh, unavailable or traveling at the time. The 281-340-0409 is the telephone number for the um, laser analysis division. Um, Jesse has also just typed his cell phone number for you guys into the chat hand window that if you need to contact him directly. Um, if there are no questions at this time, like I said, feel free to contact us if you have questions in the future. And I'd also like to mention that the seminar was recorded and will be available for replaying 24 to 48 hours under our technical library of our webpage. And we hope to see you online at other future seminars. So if there are no other questions, thank you guys and have a great time. We will stay on the line for just a few more minutes to let anybody who is typing to um, get their messages into us now or the questions into us now. Otherwise, thanks and have a great day, everybody.